Any particular questions? Well, what we're going to do most of this, this afternoon is we're going to talk about collinearity, which is not going to be covered on the exam. Now, that doesn't mean it's not an, it doesn't mean it's not an important topic. It's something that you have to worry about. It's something that's going to be covered on the next exam. So I hope you don't totally tune out because we're not doing this on Thursday. We're not going to, you're not going to be, it does relate to some issues uh, that's going to be, you know, that, that relates to the issues we've talked about, but the details of it is going to be covered today and it's going to be related to what's on the, on the next exam. So I want to talk about this now, and that's what I'm going to spend most of the class doing. And um, if I understand uh, correctly, you've all heard something. You've heard the word before, collinearity. How many of you have heard the word? OK. Did you get it in another course? Did you hear it in another course? In the course you took the uh, five, what is it? The BIOS 591 course was it discussed there, or mentioned there. So we're going to talk about that. Maybe that's where you heard it, because I don't think there's any other place you've heard it unless you came from somewhere else where it was discussed, or you've read about it somehow, or you've read it in advance in terms of what's in the textbook. So I want to start talking. So this is something that's, again, sort of new. So I want to start off by talking about this is my sort of my outline. What is co collinearity? It's sometimes referred to as multicollinearity, and I'll explain that. I want to talk about examples of collinearity. <clears throat> um, collinearity when you're dealing with a model with only two predictors, then collinearity, collinearity with several predictors, and then issues about how you diagnose collinearity. Now, I preface all this by saying, Almost all the literature on collinearity has done it with regard to linear regression. Linear regression. And what we've been doing throughout this whole semester is talking about logistic regression. So um, I need to explain something about how you deal with collinearity with logistic regression today. And there's a, in fact, um, there, uh, <clears throat> if you were doing linear regression and you were using SAS, uh, there's this program called PROC REG that you probably used last semester. PROC regression, is that right? Uh, and there is an option, part of the program in PROC REG called the Colin option. Okay. By the way, one of your TAs is Lindsay Colin. So collinearity was named after her. <laughs> no, we just kidded around the other, you know. <laughs> Colin option, right? So, um, uh, but but anyhow, um, there is this option in the proc ray. Uh, so if you're using linear, but we're doing um, logistic regression, and we're going to be doing survival analysis, and there are, there are other kinds of modeling techniques. And it turns out in the proc logistic program in SAS, there's no collinearity option. There's no colin option there. So what's been done in order to be able to assess collinearity and logistic regression, but also in other modeling procedures like survival analysis and other things, um, is there, there a macro was written. Macro was written, was originally drafted maybe about 20 years ago from, by some fellow at CDC named Matthew Zack, and it only related to logistic regression. And then uh, over the years, um, people started using other modeling programs. And there needed to be some fine tuning of that macro. And so in the last um, several years, uh, some of our students and uh, faculty at Emory here in the School of Public Health updated the macro. And there's a colin macro, which is what you have to use. And I'm going to, in, in order to assess collinearity for logistic regression, I'm going to show you how it works before I, before I finish today. But let, let, me, um, let me start talking about, well, what is collinearity? Okay. And, Collinearity, as I say on this slide here, is a problem that you can get or that can occur when you're doing an analysis, when you're fitting a mathematical model in which if you look at the 
the model and how the model is written, there's the left-hand side of the model, which, descri <coughs> which describes the outcome variable, and then there's the right-hand side of the, of the model, which describes the predictors, the x variables that go in the model, one of which might be an exposure variable, and then there might be other variables that you're controlling for, and there may be product terms. Okay, now, when you're talking about collinearity, what you're worried about is the terms on the right-hand side of the model, the x's. They could be exposure, they could be uh, uh, confounders, effect modifiers, whatever. But you're worried about that those X's on the right-hand side may be very strongly related to one another. They may be very, as I say here, one or more of the independent variables in one's model, the predictors, may be highly correlated with other variables in the model. In fact, the, the key issue is whether it's highly correlated with a linear function of other variables in the model. So if some of the X's in the model, and then there's other, you've got some X's and you've got other X's, if once you know three of the X's, some of the other X's are completely determined or almost completely determined from the earlier X's, what's going to happen is you're going to get a sort of a, a not a, a, a bad, potentially a bad result when you run the model, when you actually crank your data into a computer program, look at the output, you're going to get a result that's going to actually be unreliable. It's going to give you unreliable estimates where you, where you can't have any confidence that you're making any good conclusions. So that's the big, biggest problem with collinearity. If you have variables on the right-hand side that are very strongly related to other variables on the right-hand side and you run the model, including everybody, all these variables, then it's going to turn out you can get unreliable results. Okay. In fact, another way of saying unreliable can lead to highly unstable estimated regression coefficients. What does that mean, unstable regression coefficients? Well, one way to say that is you get a, a beta, a beta that's in your model, and then there's a beta hat is the thing you estimate it from, the, from your data. If you're talking, if beta hat's unstable, what you're saying is the variance or the standard deviation of that beta hat is very high. It's too high higher than it should be because of the model that you're running. So that's one way of saying it's unstable. Uh, a more general way is to say that it's, is that because the variance is so high or it's so much higher than it should be, you can't rely on that beta hat. You, you, you really can't put your trust in beta hat. And that also means if you go E to the beta hat to get an odds ratio, you can't rely on the odds ratio. That's another way of saying it. So. That's the problem with collinearity. In fact, if you have what's called perfect collinearity, the model won't even run. That's what I say at the bottom. There may be no solution to the est to estimation. You try to run the model, and you get an answer that says it's not going to run. Okay. And I think I gave you an, an example of that um, when I originally talked about multicollinearity a few classes ago, where you tr you had a variable that you wanted to put in the model that was a categorical variable. Let's say it had five categories. And so that means if you want to put that variable in the model, what you do is you put four dummy variables in the model for the five categories. Remember that? That's what you usually do when you have any kind of regression model, whether it's logistic regression or linear regression, whatever. But if it turns out you put in five dummy variables instead of four dummy variables, it would turn out that once you know any four of those, of those dummy variables, the fifth one is going to completely be determined. And if you try to run that model with those five dummy variables and an intercept, the model won't run. That's an example of perfect collinearity. That's why you have to have four dummy variables. If you put in five, you won't get an answer. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, I say at the bottom of this slide, which is a little, not as easy seen, is that collinearity may involve only two highly correlated variables, but that in general, collinearity may involve a relationship among three or more variables. Now, you see, what that statement says is you might think of, if you're talking about X's, predictors being related to one another, well, one simple way of thinking about it is you've got two predictors. They're very highly correlated with one another. The correlation between X and X1 and X2 or age and blood pressure, whatever you're talking about, is really high, like 0.98 or something like that. That doesn't seem to be the case in terms of those two variables that I picked out. But depending on the variables you're dealing with, you might get some variables that are very, very highly correlated. 
So you might think that if you're talking about and if you're worried about collinearity, what you're worried about is high correlations between any two variables. That's one way to think about it. And that makes you think of something called a correlation matrix. What's a correlation matrix? Correlation matrix, a matrix is just a term, a sort of a semi-mathematical term for an array of numbers, and a correlation matrix just lists all the correlations between any two variables that you're dealing with in your model. It even could it even include the outcome variable. But if you're talking about a correlation matrix that involves um, any of the predictors and forgetting about the outcome variable, and you look at that, all the correlations in there, and you see some correlations that are almost close to one, that suggests that there are two, at least two variables in the model that it looks, looks like they're saying the same thing. Got that? So, so that's one way you can think about worrying about coloniality. There's two, uh, there, there are variables that pairwise, they're very highly correlated. But the statement I said, coloniality may involve a relationship among three or more variables. So it's possible that if you know two variables, they're not necessarily highly correlated. But if you know two variables, they predict, strongly predict the third one. So it's not just a single correlation between two variables that might cause a problem. It may mean that there's a three variable collinearity problem. And if you just try to look at a, a what's called a correlation matrix, you're not necessarily going to find that because the correlation matrix only looks at pairwise uh, relationships between two variables. So then how do you detect or how do you determine collinearity? How do you do that? Well, that's one of the things we're going to talk about. So, okay, so it's not just involves two variables. And then the other thing I say down here at the bottom is collinearity may involve more than one relationship among several variables. Variable x1 may be highly correlated with variable x4, and variable x2 may be highly correlated with, with x3 and x4. That, that's an example, if that happened, of two collinearity problems. There's x, well, what do I say, x1 and x4, that's one problem. And then there's x2, which is highly correlated with x3 and x4. That's two problems. So that's why the term multicollinearity is often used instead of just collinearity, because you might have more than one collinearity problem. And again, one of the issues, a key issue, is how do you how do you detect it? And if you can detect it or diagnose it, and this program, this Colin program, used for proclogistic and other other modeling procedures, um, helps you to diagnose whether there's a collinearity problem. But well, once you've diagnosed it, the next, the next thing we have to talk about, well, what do you do about it? If you say there's a collinearity problem, can you do anything about it? Or do you just give up and, you know, just go do something else for your life? Or I'm not sure, you know. Well, there are things we'll talk about, what you can do about it, okay? So another way to talk about what we mean by collinearity, well, sort of what I've said is that if there's an approximate linear dependency among the independent variables in one's model, so the independent variables are called x's. You know, the, the, that's generally how it's usually done. And the outcome variables are usually called the y, although we've got x's, some of which are exposures, some of which are c variables, some of which we've called v's, and then there's ew's. Got all these different names. But we're really talking about the basic set of predictors, the x's. And if it turns out this statement is, tr is, a pro is true, this says that there's a relationship among the x's, and there's a linear relationship among the x's. Now, you notice that in this expression, you see this term before the zero. What is that? Is that an equal sign? It's an approximation sign, right? It says basically that if there's a linear relationship, a linear function, some constant times x1 plus another constant times x2 and so on, if, there's a, if a linear function is approximately equal to zero, that's an example, that's what we mean by collinearity. Now, of course, if you think about simple mathematics, if this was true, you can solve this sort of equation. It's not exactly an equation because there's an approximation sign, but it's saying that approximation says it's almost zero. You can solve using the approximation sign for any one of these variables in terms of any of the other variables, just using algebra. So if I wanted to solve using this expression, x1 in terms of the other x's, I can write just using algebra. x1 is approximately equal to minus the linear sum of the others, 
divided by A1. And that's another way of saying it. it looks like there's a bunch of X's that are predicting another X. That's what you mean by collinearity. That's the idea behind collinearity. So one predictor can be approximately determined by a linear function of the other predict predictors. That's sort of the idea, okay? Now, let's start looking at examples or situations. Uh, one situation, as I've already said, is you could have two variables that you're studying or you're measuring that are very highly correlated. And if that's the case, that's an example of collinearity. If they're so highly correlated, it's going to make your model unstable. Now, we, we need to see what that means, but uh, that's one thing. Another example is, like I said, different examples. You can have a third variable, x3, which is highly correlated between the difference between two other variables. That's a collinearity problem that involves three of the predictors, not two of the predictors. And you can't see that if you're looking at a correlation matrix. Now, another problem that often shows up when you're dealing with, uh, when you're worried about collinearity, is that if you've got product terms in the model, like interaction effects, E times one of the variables you're controlling for, well, E times X1 is made up of the product of two components of it. Now, because of that, certainly you can expect that the product is not un completely unrelated with the components made of making up the product. And if it turns out, depending on what these variables are, and depending upon your data, EX1 is highly correlated to the components that are making it up, you can have a collinearity problem, okay? And then, even lastly, you can have a variable in the model like age, and if you put in age square, well, age square comes from age. So there is some correlation between age and age square. How strong it is may depend upon a number of things, particularly how many, how many age, uh, age, um, ages you measure, how, what the size of your sample size, and all of that. But these are examples where you could have this problem could occur. And as I said, it may not be sufficient to consider only pairwise correlations because correlations could involve more than, uh, more than two variables. Okay, so are, are you with me so far? And I haven't done anything very fancy. I'm just talking, right? Okay, so now, uh, I'm going to skip this, but it could be two variables may not be inherently collinear. Gender and race, they're not inherently collinear, but in your data, they may be collinear because you don't have a lot of data. And it turns out they're collinear. So I have an example like that. But now I want to focus on this slide. I want to focus on this slide. Now, look at what's on this slide. Look at the top on the slide. What kind of a model are we talking about here on the top? Is this a logistic model? It's a linear model, right? And as I said, most of the work that was done on collinearity had to do with linear regression. So I'm going to say a couple of things about a linear regression. Okay, now, so here's a linear model. It only involves two variables, two predictors, x1 and x2, and there's an outcome, y, okay? Now, it turns out that for any linear model involving two variables, you can do a little mathematics or a little algebra and if you fit the model, how do you fit a linear model? Do you remember how you fit a linear model that you learned last semester? The method was called least squares. And you use a program to do it. You know, so that's how you fit it. But if you fit the model, you get estimates of the different parameters, the betas in the, in the model. And you can get not only the estimate, beta 1 hat and beta 2 hat and so on, but you can also get the estimated variances of these estimates. And, the, and the take the square root, and you get the standard errors of the estimates, OK? So it turns out that through a little algebra, you can sh one can show that if you have a model with only two variables in it, x1 and x2, that the estimated variance of beta 1 hat has this formula. Then the estimated variance of beta 2 hat, we're talking about these two coefficients, has this formula. Now, you notice. Look at the formula on the left. Well, K1 stands for some constant, some number, whatever it is, that's going to come out the matter, and it'll be different depending upon what the data says. But look at this part of the formula. What does this part say? It's 1 over 1 minus, what's that? R squared. R squared of what? It's the correlation between X1 and X2, right? That's what this says. And there it is on the right-hand side. Okay, so if you look at this, what this says is, if you got data 
So it's, and you only have two variables. And if it turns out that these two variables are perfectly correlated, perfectly related to one another, what's the R square? One. And what's one minus R square? Zero. And what's one over one minus zero? What's over one over zero? What's, what's one over zero? It's infinite. It's undetermined. You can't determine that number, right? What does that say about the variance? If you got two variables in a model and they're perfectly collinear, then it turns out the estimate is completely unreliable. The variance of the estimate is completely, the, the variability of the estimate is as unreliable as it could be. It's infinite, okay? Which essentially means you can't put any reliability, you can't put any uh, sense, you can't make any sense out of any one of these estimates, okay? That's what this says, okay? And if it turns out that the R square between x1 and x2 isn't, isn't 1, but close to 1, then what that means is that the variance is going to be high because this is 1 over something close to 0. 1 over something close to 0 is a large number. So the closer the correlation is, the more the variance blows up and the more unreliable the model is. That's what this says. You got that? Got that idea? And this is just with linear regression with two predictive variables, okay? And now it makes you think that maybe there's a way, just from this, there's a way you can do something to try to say when you're likely to get or what you might measure to diagnose collinearity. And what this sort of says is, what about using this term, one over, because it's in both these, it's in both these expressions, one over one minus r squared. Now remember, this is the term so that depending on how close the r is to one or the r squared is to one, Closer it is, the more the variance blows up and the worse you have, okay? So this expression is often referred to as a variance inflation factor. That's something you can calculate if you have two variables, you have the R square, to give you some idea of whether the variance is getting too high or blow. Now, how high is high is a problem. So we need to talk about that. But it's called the variance inflation factor. So that's one way people consider measuring collinearity. And what I'm saying is the higher this number is, the more likely you have a problem, a collinearity problem. Okay. Now this relates to just a, 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 linear, regr a linear regression, not a logistic regression. And a linear regression only involves two variables. What if you got a linear regression involving several variables? The variance inflation factor for a linear regression containing more than two x's can be written like this, 1 over 1 minus r square i, r sub i square, I should say, where r sub i is the r square for predicting one of the x's from the other x, from the rest of the x's, okay? So in other words, let's say you had a model with 10 x's in it, okay, 10 x's, okay? And you fit that linear, it's a linear regression model. And you compute, R, you compute R square, you can do it for the whole model, but you compute 10 R squares, R sub I square. You compute one R square relates the first X with the other nine X's. You've got 10 X's. X1 regressed on the other nine X's. X2 regressed on the other nine X's, which now will include X1. You get several R squares. How? One X is predicted by all the other X's, just only focusing on the predictors, okay? Now, if it turns out you can predict X1 from all the other, from doing a regression on all the other predictors, what's R square going to be? If X, what's R1 square going to be? It's going to be close to 1, right? So what's 1 minus 1 over 1 minus r squared. It's going to be close to 0. So that's, again, when the variance blows up, if you can measure this factor, this is so when you have linear regression with several variables, this is one of the measures that's been considered using for assessing this collinearity problem. This is, this is when you've got several variables. If any one x can be predicted by the other x's and you've got 10 x's, it'll be nine different r squares that you're looking at. If, if you've got VIF, any, v, any one of those 10 VIFs is high, that suggests that you've got a problem. Variance is blowing up and some x's are predicted from other x's. Now again, how high is high is an issue. 
Well, one thing is you can show when you're doing linear regression that the variance, the estimated variance, is proportional to this variance inflation factor. You can also show that if clearly, you're also going to see algebraically that if the ri square is equal to 1, then the VIF is infinite, so it blows up. That's when you got perfect prediction of one x, x from any of the other x's. Now, I'm only talking about the x's here. Now, there's a rough rule that's been used, and it's a rough rule, but it's not so bad. It says that if the VIF, if you actually have done a linear regression, and you compute the VIF for any one x compared to the other nine x's or the other x's you have in your model. So if you had 10 x's, you'd have 10 VIFs, uh, 10 VIF computa computations. You look at any one of them, if any one of them is greater than 10, that suggests collinearity. That suggests collinearity. Now, you can do a little algebra with this formula, which basically says if 1 over 1 minus ri squared is greater than 10, that means that ri has got to be greater than 0.95. That means there's a higher or ri squared. The, the squared correlation is greater than 0.90. That's a strong what's called multiple correlation coefficient, or square of a multiple correlation coefficient. So this is what a lot of people have, re have recommended you use to assess collinearity. But there's a problem with it. And here's the, the problem with it. That's why it's not used that much. But I want to introduce that and tell you what the problem is. The problem is, look at this. Next slide. Okay. Now, I, I took an example, 10x. Suppose you have a model, a linear regression model with 10x's. Okay. And suppose these were the 10 VIFs that you got. Now, I didn't list them all because I couldn't get them all on the screen. I'm just trying to give you an example anyhow. Now, I've circled two of them. Why have I circled those two? They're greater than 10, right? So when you look at these 10 VIFs and you're asking the question, do I think there's a collinearity problem, okay, what are you likely to say? If you, you, if you just agree with what I've sort of been saying here, it looks like you can say that yeah, it looks like there's a collinearity problem because two of the VIFs are high. And if it turns out these were the only two of the 10 that were high, what might you think is the source of the problem? Might be that X2 and X10 are highly correlated, and you can check that out. Okay, You can check that out by looking at the correlation between X2 and X10. But if you just fit the linear model, you're doing something altogether before you're looking at different correlations. Could be a lot of correlations depending on how many variables you have in the model. This suggests that x2 and x10 are highly correlated. Okay. Now, I say something at the top, and I'll go back to that in a second, but look at this next example. What if you saw this? Different, different situation. Okay. Is there collinearity based on VIFs? And the answer would be, it looks like there is because there's at least, there's three of them that are larger than 10, okay? That's what this says. Now, if I had to try to diagnose, well, what's going on? Where's the collinearity? What's the problem? It's not so easy to do when there's three, or more than three, because is the problem involving these three variables, x2, x6, and x10, that, that once you know one, or once you know two of them, the third one is determined? Or does it involve two collinearity problems, x2 with x6, and x2 with x10. Is there one problem? Is there two problems? How many problems are there and what are the problems? So that's, that's what, what I say at the bottom. Not clear if there's one collinearity problem involving x2, x6, and x10, or two collinearity problems involving, say, any, any pair of them. Now, I go back to this slide. Look what I said on the top here. I said, however, the VIFs do not indicate how many collinearity problems there are or which variables are involved in which problems. That's what the using VIFs doesn't do. So using VIFs is sort of a nice way to look at collinearity because you can see what's going on. You can see that if one variable is predict, one predictor is predicted by the other predictors, well, you got some idea that, that there's some linear relationship in there. But you don't really, it's not easy to diagnose what the source of the problem is and what to do about it. 
So there's another way to go about doing this, and that's what I'm going to now talk to you about. And it involved, um, it involved some research that was done and written up in a book by three people, Belsey, Koo, and Welch, in a book called Regression Diagnostics, written in 1982. And it's this work that's really the res what's really gone into SAS. You know that thing I mentioned, the colon option and proc reg? That's based on what, was, what came out of this book. Okay. They also had some things in the book. The book was primarily focused on linear regression and not on logistic regression. And they also had a few things about it, but they never really did a good job with logistic regression. And they wrote a later book, still didn't do a great job with it. So, uh, but anyhow, that's the source, the BKW book, as opposed to K, K, and M, or K and K, or whatever you want to call it, the BK and M, BK and W book. Now, to, to explain that, I'm just going to show you a table. I'll show you a table, and we're going to look at this table. So this is the essence of what's going on, or how you diagnose collinearity. Now, there's some terms, there's numbers in this table, a lot of numbers. There's numbers, there's something called CI. CI, in this case, does not stand for confidence interval. It stands for something else. It stands for something called condition index. That's a nice name to name drop. I tell you friends, you know, I learned about condition indices. And so these numbers are called condition indices. And the numbers within the table are different numbers, and they're called VDPs. And that stands for, again, another name dropping term, variance decomposition proportion. Now, just by saying that makes you start to twitch a little bit, right? Variance decomposition proportion. Oh, my God. I don't want to know what that is, but we're going to talk about it. I'm going to figure, figure it out, okay? Now, uh, now you notice on this table, there's a bunch of numbers in here. Notice at the top of the table, can you tell what model might have been fit here? This is made up, some made-up data, but can you tell from what's written at the top of the table what the model is? And this is, this is at this point, this is a linear regression from the colon option linear regression. But what variables were in the model? an E variable, three C's, and three E C's, right? That's the model that was fit, okay? Now, I'm, what I'm saying is suppose that's the model you fit, and you got this stuff that came out, these numbers that came out. How can, what can you do about collinearity or a diagnose it, or what can you do about it if you saw this, okay? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to go down this column, the CI column, not the condition, not the uh, confidence interval, the condition index column. And what you have to do is you go down the column and you look for, you still can see whether these numbers are getting, they're, they're going to get larger, okay? The key issue is how large did they get, and particularly how large is the largest of these numbers, okay? Now, you notice, by the way, how many variables are in this model? One, the intercept. One, two, three, how many parameters are in the model? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I count eight of them, okay? How many condition indices are there? You can count them, there are eight. So for every number of variables you have, you have the same number of condition indices, okay? Big deal, okay? The main thing you're doing is you're gonna look down in this column, you're gonna look for the largest one. Now the largest one here is 99.8, right? That's what you see. Okay. Now, that number is in bold, and the reason why it's in bold is because that number, based on this research that Belzy, Kuhn, and Wells did, would be considered high. <laughs> that would be a, a, something to indicate possible collinearity. Now, they came up in this book, they spent half their, I don't know, it was half their life, three years, whatever it is, writing a book about collinearity. You know, that's what they did, okay? Now, do you, you might think you'd rather do something else, you know, but they did this and they made a great contribution in any, in any case. Now, in that book, they, they did a whole bunch of examples and situations and, uh, uh, and, base, and simulations and stuff like that, and they deci roughly decided, they gave, made a rough rule, that if the condition index is more or less higher than 30, where did that number come from? But they did this out of looking at simulations, looking at a lot of different, more or less higher than 30, that suggests a collinearity problem. And what do you see here? 
99.8, right? That's a lot larger than 30. So that suggests there's a collinearity problem. So as soon as you go down this thing, so, oh, wait a second, I think there's something wrong with this model, some problem with this model, okay? Now, it also turns out, if you look at the next highest condition index, that's also 30, or it's a little larger than 30, and all the rest of them are much smaller than 30, okay? So you're tempted to say, by looking at this information, that not only is there a collinearity problem associated with the 99.8, but something associated with the 30.8. Because if the number, if this condition index, whatever it means, is 30 or higher, that suggests a collinearity problem. So this suggests maybe there's two problems. Get what I'm saying? So it suggests that there's two problems. However, that's not the way you should proceed to address collinearity. What you have to do is you have to say, well, look, I'm going to look at the first one. 99.8. And I'm going to decide whether I think that's a collinearity problem by checking out these other information, the VDPs in there. And then based on that, I'm going to make a decision about what to do about if there's a collinearity problem involving the 99.8, I'm going to make a decision to, to, to do something about that. And then if I decide to do something about that, which might be changing the model or dropping a variable from the model, if I decide to do that, then I'm going to refit the model and see if there's another collinearity problem. So you see what I said? Rather than say there's two problems because two of them are 30 or higher, I'm going to deal with these problems one at a time. I'm going to deal with the first one. I'm going to do it sequentially. I'm going to deal with the first one. If there's a problem with the first one and I can do something about it, I'll do something about it and then see if there's a second one. And maybe there isn't a second one once I deal with the first one. So you deal with collinearity sequentially. Okay. Now, let's look at this. Now, let's look at these other numbers. Now, you notice I got these, these numbers are in bold. Look at the 99.8. Now, if you want to evaluate where the problem is, you have to look at these things called the VDPs. Now, you notice I've, I'm just looking at the 99.8. I'm going on this row over here, OK? And what, do I, what have I done? I've, I've put some of these numbers in bold, right? In that line with the 99.8, in that row with the 99. Which ones did I put in bold? The largest ones, OK? So what I'm basically saying is there are three VDPs, whatever that is, that are relatively high compared to the other VDPs. Now, when you think of VDP, which, you, you know, makes you think, makes you go crazy a little bit, but I'll tell you something. If you look at any one of these columns, look at any one of these columns, and add up the numbers in any one, look at the E column, add up the numbers in the E column, what do you get? One, right? You add up the numbers in any other column, what do you get? One, right? So it turns out that the numbers in a given column represent the proportion of all the numbers you can get for that particular variable. It really describes the proportion of something, of the variability or something associated with that variable. And it basically looks like there's a large proportion relative to the other, to, to, for this variable on this condition index, whatever that means, okay? so. That's what's going on here. So now what you do is you say, OK, this is how you proceed here. I'm just telling you how you proceed. What you do is you look at these three numbers and you say, well, look, if there's a collinearity problem, it involves the variables that correspond to these three large VDPs. What are those variables? Anybody tell me what those variables are? What would you do? Go up to the top. E, C3, I made these numbers up, but this is, you go up to the top, C3, and EC3. So the way you would look at this data is you'd first identify whether you've got a condition index larger than 30, you look at the largest one. Then you look at the VDPs, and you look at the larger ones. And you, uh, you flag them, or you put them in bold. And then those are the ones that suggest that, there's, that, re that relates to a collinearity problem, according to this theory that they did. And then you go up to find the variables. And it looks like the variables are EC3 and EC3. That's the way you'd work on that. Now, if you decided, based on what I just did, 
that there is a collinearity problem, and it involves these three variables, EC3 and EC3. What does that mean? What does that mean? Based on what we said about what collinearity is. It means if you had these three variables in the model, they're very strongly related to one another. You can't, you put them all in the model, you're getting an unstable model. That's the whole idea of collinearity, okay? So if, the, if you have those three variables in the model it's giving you some instability, what would you do? I get rid of one of them, right? <coughs> it means that if I leave all three in the model, I don't have a good model. Which one would I get rid of? The E, the C3, or the EC3? I have to get rid of the interaction. If I got rid of the lower order term, then I have a model that's not hierarchically well formulated. So what I do is get rid of the EC3 term, okay? And I would hope that maybe that solves the collinearity problem. In what way would I hope that it solves the collinearity problem? Think about that, what I've just said. In other words, I've just decided that the, there is a problem involving EC3 and EC3, and I'm gonna drop the only one I can drop, okay? And it's EC3, and then what am I gonna do? Remember I said you have to do it sequentially? What I'm going to do is I'm going to refit the model without EC3 in there. I'm going to look at the same information, but I don't have EC3 in the model. And then I'm going to look for the largest condition index among the seven variables that I have. I've dropped EC3. And if the largest condition index is larger than 30, then I've got a second collinearity problem that I'm going to try to look at. But if the largest condition index after I drop EC3 is a lot less than 30, I've done my job. I've taken care of collinearity by dropping this one that's causing the problem. That's how you do it, okay? Now, there's another big issue with all this. You know, the first issue I talked about, there's an issue with collinearity. People have a problem with this. First thing is, how large is large on the condition index? And what did I say? I said 30, right? Where'd that come from? came from these guys who wrote this book, who did a whole bunch of work. Is it, thir is it 30? Is it 32? Is it 38? You know, it was a guideline. It wasn't a firm number, okay? So how do you interpret the 30? If you got a 29, do you say it's under 30? You know, there's a problem with that. Well, the other problem is, what about these numbers I put in bold, the VDPs that I put in bold? Look at the 0.70, the 0.930, and the 0.430. Well, they're the largest three in there, but the 0.430, that's the smaller of the smallest of those three, right? Well, how large is it? Well, they had a rough rule, again, a rough rule based on all the work that they did, spending the rest of their whole life doing this or something like that. They had this rule which said if the VDP is 5, 0.5 or higher, that suggests a problem. Well, what about the 0 0.430? It's not higher than 0.5, but it's not that far away from it. So that's why I put it in bold, okay? And that, that's what, that's some of the issues that you have to, how, how large is large? And I basically said it looks like there were, three, there were three possible variables. If I left it out, I could still say, well, maybe it involves C3 and EC3. I have to drop EC3, but it, it makes sense to put this one here. Okay, so um, that's sort of how you do it. That's how you deal with collinearity, okay? Now, if it turns out, as it, tur as it turned out, suppose it turned out I dropped EC C I drop EC3 and I refit the model with only seven, I, with only seven. Will I get 30.8 with the seven as the largest condition index? Will I actually get 30.8 as the largest condition index after I drop EC3? Not necessarily, because I'm now fitting a different model. It's a different model. So it may be when I drop EC3, the largest one that's left is much lower than 30, and there's no, I've solved the collinearity problem. So that's the idea behind how you deal with collinearity. Okay, now, a couple of other things. There's a lot of other things here. Now, look at this table. Look at this table and compare it to this table. This table, this table. This is like an eye exam. This table, this table. This table, this table. Remember that? Okay. Oh, not that one. This one, 
and this one. What's the difference between these two tables? I've just rotated it, right? I've rotated it. So the 99.8 and the 30.8 are now on the rows, and the other and the uh, and the VDPs are sort of reversed. It's a mirror image. Okay. Now the reason why I showed you this is because if you're going to try to diagnose collinearity using the linear regression, using the colin option, this is what the colin the table is going to look like that you're going to have to use to uh, uh, diagnose whether there's a collinearity problem. If you're using the macro that, I, that I've been talking about, the macro to diagnose collinearity, this is what the table is going to look like. So it's a mirror image. So you've got to be able to roll with the punches. That's what the, if you're using logistic regression or survival analysis, which you talk about after, we talk about after the midterm, this is what the data is going to look like. This is what, yes, question back there. This is Morong? That's okay. You, know. <laughs> you win some and you lose some. Go ahead. This one. Yeah, so Same one as this one. Okay. Well, that, that, that's a good question here. That's a very, I'm glad you asked that. Because if I drop EC3 from this model because of collinearity, am I saying that EC3 is not significant? It's not a significant predictor of the outcome. Am I saying, I think that's what you're asking. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's what you're asking. I have dropped EC3 not because I did a statistical test to see it's significant over, you know, given the other variables in the model. I dropped it because there's a collinearity problem. Okay? So because I dropped EC3, I'm not doing it because it's not significant. It's not doing it. I'm doing it because if I left it in the model, I get a model that's all messed up. That's why I'm doing it. Okay? So it doesn't mean that if I had enough data or I had a model that didn't have a collinearity problem and an EC3 was in it, that it wouldn't be, it would either be significant or not significant because I'm not doing a statistical test. So when you determine that something's collinear, you're not saying that it's not significant. You're just saying that you can't have it in the model in order to keep the model reliable. That's what you're saying. I think that's what you meant, right? So thank you. That's good. OK. So now there are some other things. OK. Look at this slide. Different set of data, different set, different information. What about this? Is there a collinearity problem based on what you see? Now, you, did, there's, you notice there's no um, product terms. Is there a collinearity problem? Well, this is higher than 30, right? What do we do next? We look over here, and what do we see? There are two VDPs that are high. One is on the intercept, whoa, and one is on C3, right? Well, that's a little weird. This is not in the intercept. What kind of a variable is the intercept? Does the intercept, does the variable that correspond to the intercept vary? No, it's just a variable one, 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 one. That's what it is. That's what the intercept, that's what the variable that corresponds to the intercept is. So if you saw something like this, you'd, you'd be a little, you know, not sure what to do. Because does this mean if C3 is collinear with the intercept, what does that mean? Okay. Well, the only thing it may make sense to mean, and I've got a couple of statements in here, but the only thing it might make sense to mean is that since the intercept doesn't vary, and if C3 is collinear with the intercept, that would mean C3 doesn't vary, right? I mean, if it's highly correlated with the intercept, which the variable is a bunch of ones, then it would mean C3 shouldn't be changing. Now. How will you how will you be able to diagnose whether C3 is changing or not? 
You look at your data and decide whether C3 is changing. If you decide it's changing enough for you, you don't drop C3. You say, okay, I got a number here that was high, but this information doesn't say there's a collinearity problem because it will suggest maybe there is. Maybe I should drop C3. If C3 is a variable that never changes, who cares? Who needs it in the model? But if it does change, you want to keep it in the model because it's a variable you identified at the begin with as a variable you were worried about. So sometimes you can get a high condition index and you can decide there's nothing going on and you can't drop a variable. You have to do that. So there are some things like this. Now, I'm going to skip some things here and I'm going to skip this because this is this, these two slides, these slides here explain what a condition index is and what a VDP is, the mathematics behind it. Okay? We don't have time for that. And most of you don't care. Right? What you want to know is what do you do? Okay, and I told you what you can do. I haven't told you everything that you can do. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, and this is, okay, now, okay, what do you do about collinearity? What do you do about collinearity? Well, one thing you do that we did with the example that looked like this collinearity is you drop one or more variables involved in a collinearity problem. And I recommend you do this sequentially by refitting a new model. That's basically what you do. But it's not the only thing to do. Another thing you could do is define a new predictor. If you think two variables are very highly correlated, and those two variables make some sense, like what if it turns out the two variables didn't involve interaction? One was um, weight and the other was height. And they were highly collinear. So if you put them both in the model, separately in the model, the model would be unstable. How could you get around that? Huh? Calculate BMI. Calculate BMI. Weight over height square. I think that's BMI. Weight over height square, right? Is put that, own, that single variable in the model. So you've gotten rid of a problem by defining a new variable. That's a way you can get rid of collinearity and still have a meaningful model. And so you can't have these two variables, but you can have something in there. Something called censoring, but it turns out it's debatable procedure, and it generally doesn't work. You know, so that's all I'm going to say about that, because it really is not a good thing to do. And there are some papers about that. But and then, of course, another thing you could do, but you don't generally do that in most epidemiologic studies, is you add some more data. Maybe if you, if you, if you add another 50 people to the study that you're doing, maybe you won't find a collinearity problem. Maybe the problem turns out is you didn't have enough data and certain variables are highly correlated because you don't have enough of them. You don't have enough sample size. But you often don't do that because you've done your study. You're not going to spend another $100,000 getting some more data or something like that. Okay, so that's what you do about collinearity. Now, I don't say anything about, but now what I want to say is, okay, there's a problem that I've already said something about. The problem with logistic regression versus linear regression. The problem with logistic regression is the program, proc logistic, doesn't have an option called the colin option. So if you want to assess collinearity with logistic regression, you don't have that option. What you have to do is use this macro, this colin macro is what you have to do. And the reason why you have to use the macro is sort of what I say over here, but I'm going to just talk about it without getting, getting into it in a big way because of time or something like that. I'm just going to get the idea. Now, let me make the point. The main idea that you're worried about, about collinearity, is when does the variance blow up? Remember in that example I gave with the two, X, two predictors? When do you have a model such that if you fit the model, the variance blows up? Okay, that's the key issue. Well, it turns out when you're using linear regression, the model has a certain mathematical formula for what the variance is. There's a certain mathematical expression for the variance. When you're using logistic regression, it's a different expression for the variance. So if you're asking when you're doing linear regression, when does the model blow up? You're using the formula for linear regression for the variance. When you ask for logistic regression, when is the model blow up? It's a different formula. Turns out for linear regression, it's something called the X prime X inverse matrix. 
And for nonlinear models, or like logistic regression, it's something called the information matrix. So what it means is, all it means is that if you're going to uh, use logistic regression, you can't use a linear regression program because it would be using the wrong variance formula to see when it blows up. So what you want to use is use the right formula, and the right formula is built into the macro. So let's look at the macro. That's where we're, we're right near the end of the class here. Let's look at the macro. Here's the macro. Well, here, yeah, here's the macro. I've skipped a couple of pages. Here's the basic program, okay? Now, you see in the middle of this slide, middle of this slide, you see where it says proc logistic? So what am I doing here? What kind of a model am I running? Logistic regression model. It's got data equal to vets. It's a different data set, something called the veteran administration data set. Different data set. I say descending, and I've got some other things in here. But you notice the next line, it says model. The outcome variable is some variable called status. Turns out it's a 0, 1 variable. And then there's a whole bunch of predictive variables. Treatment, small cell, adeno cell, large cell, different cancer um, tumor size, tumor categories. And then it's got performance status and disease duration, age and prior therapy status. And then it's got something called Cove B, okay? But that's the model is, this is the model. Treat all these other things, just like you saw when you ran logistic regression up to this point. Okay, now, and this is the, now, what, what I've done here is, I've added something, I've ran, added some stuff. You see where it says percent include, and then it says macro file name? Well, the name of the macro is colon underscore 2011.sas. That's the name of the macro. So if I want to run the colon macro, I have to tell the computer where the colon macro is located on the computer. And it's located in the S file under epi740. And it tells you it's a macro, and it's, this is the name of the macro. So if I write percent include, and then I go, I put in a quote, and then a quote at the end, and I put in this information, I'm telling the computer where the macro is that I want it to use. I have to tell them that in order to use the macro. I mean, this is not the worst thing that you've ever had to do. It tells the computer where the macro is. Then you tell the computer what the problem is, I mean, what, the, what you're running, and you tell it a bunch of things. Now, one thing you notice, you see there's a statement called outtest equal info, and I've circled this thing called info, okay? And then I've done a bunch of stuff, and then I've got percent colon, and then I've got some other stuff here. Now, you notice this line, percent colon, this information is when this thing at the top tells the computer where the macro is in your computer. This runs the macro. Percent colon runs the macro, okay? And what it does is it runs the, in order to run the macro, you have to say, you have to have this, you have to have some name for something called COVDSM. What do you think COV stands for? Covariance. What is covariance related to? Variance. Variance, covariance, you know? So if, you know, and, and the issue is when does the variance blow up? You know, so when you write this thing, you're telling the computer, giving it the, the information about what the covariance, variance, covariance matrix, or the variance is, the variance formula is that I said is a mess, but you don't have to worry about it because it's built into the program. In fact, that particular formula is called, is, is obtained by this cove out statement. And when you write info over here, you're telling the computer what that formula is. You're telling the computer where to find the formula, okay? And then output equal to, now if you use the same information, it used to be that you could do that, but now you have to have some, something different. Now you see where I said O-U-T-L-R? What do you think L-R stands for? Logistic regression, that's why I wrote L-R, okay? So I wrote output, L so the output information is coming out in some statement, some file called the uh, out L-R. Okay, and that's what's going in, okay? Now, look at the next thing that I've got underneath this. Look at the very next thing. You see where it says proc logistic? What does it say here? Proc pH reg. So what's pH reg? 
Well, we don't know yet, unless you've already had a course in survival analysis. That's coming up after the midterm. PH reg is a modeling procedure for using what's called Cox regression. So you can use this colin macro to actually do collinearity for Cox regression. So that's what you do here, okay? But now I'm using a different name for the out test and a different name for the output file. This is out CR. CR stands for Cox regression, okay? Now, all I've done here is to show you what the code is, what you tell the computer. You have to tell the computer where the macro is, and you have to tell the computer to run the macro for the model that you're using. Now, let's look at the output. Let's look at the output. Okay, and this is all the things I've, this describes it, but let's look at the output. Okay, well, the first output I'm going to show you is what you would get if I didn't use either of these, either of these two, if I just ran, instead of proc logistic or proc ph reg, if instead I ran, let's see if it's here, it's not here. If I ran, oh yeah, here it is. If I ran SAS's reg procedure, and I said, this is my model for SAS reg. And you see this thing at the end? What does that say? Colin. So what am I doing? I'm using proc reg, and I'm using the colin option. It's the same data as I was doing. It's the same data. It's the VETS data. But now I'm doing linear regression. The outcome variable is 0, 1. I could run linear regression. It's not the right model that I'd use. I want to use it on a continuous outcome. But when I run this now, Look at what you get down here. Look at the output over here. I've circled this number, 21.37. What's that number? Can you tell me what that number is? It's in the column that says condition index, right? And, it's, and it's, all these numbers are here. It's the largest one, right? Can you see that? The largest of these condition index. Remember, I talked about what a condition index is. What do you have to do to, to diagnose collinearity? First thing you have to do is look at the condition indices when you're running the model. This is a linear regression model, and you wind up getting 21.37. Okay, what do you have? What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do with that? You say, "Well, that's lovely. Uh, let's go home." You know, no, that's lovely. Is it larger than? 30, is it? It's not, it's 10 points away from 30. It's not, it's not really close to 30. I mean, how close is close is an issue. But the Belgian Coon, that's far enough away to say what? No collinearity. So if you saw that, the 21, you wouldn't look at any of the, you see where it says variance proportion intercept, variance proportion treatment. These are all the, in the predictive variables. And it's got these VDPs. But you wouldn't even look at any of them. Because if the largest CI is not large, there's no collinearity. That's what this says. Okay. This is what it says when you do linear regression. Okay. Now, what about this? This is what happens when I use the macro. The macro that I just showed you two slides ago, the macro when I actually do, do this, on, on, on this part, the macro on the logistic, what do I get? Well, there it is. Okay. Well, this is just the fit of the model, but look down here at the bottom. You see these things over here? See the 22.7557? What's that? That's the largest condition index I get if I do logistic regression with these data, right? Is it the same as what I got previously when I did linear regression? Why not? Well, there's two different ways to do it. If you do linear regression, you're assuming a certain variance structure, which is a different formula than if you're doing logistic regression. Is it a lot different? No. 22.7557. Isn't that much different than 21.374548? So you're going to have the same conclusion about whether there's collinearity, whether you use linear regression or logistic regression. Which one should you do, though? You should do the logistic regression, the macro, because that one is dealing with the right variance formula. There's no guarantee they're going to be close. They might be close. But there's no guarantee. What does this say about whether there's a collinearity problem? None. Right? It's still a lot less than 30. Okay? So I'm just telling you how, what you do to do this. 
and how, what the output looks like. Okay? Is that the worst thing you've ever heard in your life? No, it's not okay. Now, here's a weird thing. This is something weird. Now, look at this next one. Now, I'm using pH reg, which we haven't talked about. But I'm going to use it anyhow and show you the output. pH reg. pH reg says, instead of doing linear regression, and instead of doing logistic regression on this data set, I'm going to do something called survival analysis or Cox regression, which is what we're going to be talking about after the break. That's going to be something that's going to be on the next midterm. Okay. So I'm going to do Cox regression. And I'm going to fit the same model to the same data. Well, it's not the same model, but I'm fitting the same data to a model. It's a different model. It's a Cox regression model. Look at what happened. Surprise? What's the largest condition index? Is it 22? Is it 21? It's 2. What on earth happened? OK? Well, it turns out this, makes, this is causes a problem. So what it tells you is we use the cut point 30 for the 21 and the, 20, and the 22. We use cut point 30. Should the cut point be 30 for this? If you're doing survival analysis, it turns out, we'll, we'll eventually talk about this again later. If you're doing survival analysis, it's questionable whether the cut point should be 30. It probably should be less. Why do you see it should be less? For the same data, instead of getting 22, you got a much smaller number. It's the same data. And it's the same predictive variables in the model. It's, it is a different model. Okay. So it turns out when you're doing survival analysis using Cox regression, the cut point might not be 30. It ought to be less than 30. However, nobody's come up with the right cut point. Nobody's ever come up with, should it be 20, should it be 10, should it be 5? Nobody's ever done it. And I had a student back about 15 years ago to try to do a whole bunch of simulations to figure this out, and he never figured it out, although he showed that it should be a lot less than 30. He didn't say what it should be. So anyhow, what's the message? The message is, if you want to do collinearity, what you have to do is you have to use this method by uh, Belzy, Kuh, and Welsh, which involves condition indices and, ver uh, and VDPs. And you use that table that we talked about, and this is the code for it. This is the code, wherever it is. That's, that's the table that you look at, or this table that you look at, and that's how you go about the process. So that's what you do to assess collinearity. The biggest problem with the collinearity problem is how large is large? Is 30 the right number here? Should it be 31? Should it be 35? Should it be 50? Now, if you see 99.8, you know that's large. If you see 35, you're not so sure. If you see 4.430, well, that's not that far away from 0.5, but is 0.320. I didn't put 0.325 in bold. Well, it's not as high as 0.430. So how high is high is the biggest problem with dealing with collinearity. That's the biggest problem. But why is it important? Why is it important? Let's go back to that. Why do we do this? The reason why it's important is if you try to fit a model and you put some variables in the model and the model is unstable, the model is not giving you a good answer, you don't want to fit that model. You want to drop some variables from the model. Well, what variables do you drop from the model? Well, one way to do that is to drop it according to collinearity things like we just talked about. By the way, this relates to the midterm. What's another way you can drop variables from a model? It's another way. You've got a model with 50 variables in it. Some of them are E's, some of them are C's. And you could run the model and do collinearity and see whether you can drop them that way. Okay, what's another way you can do it? Screening, what we talked about there. What's the difference between screening and this thing? Well, this, what this thing does, it actually tries to fit everything you're starting off with. Screening doesn't do that. Screening says, well, maybe I tried that and it doesn't work and I got to do something else. And so what I do is I try to drop variables one and look at them one at a time in some way as long as it's a reasonable way. So that's what screening does. Collinearity is a better way to do it, but it may not work. You may try to fit everything in the model and you find out the model doesn't run or you get, you get so much collinearity, you keep dropping interaction terms, you don't have any, you can't assess interaction because of collinearity. Well, if you can't, then you may, may try to do something different by screening variables. 
So that's what collinearity is. And I think that's what I wanted to say today. So it is quarter after five. Okay, so now, where are we with everything? Is it time to leave? Well, we could, or we could do one other thing. We can talk about one other issue that goes back a ways to several E's. Now, I can do it one of two ways. One way I can do it is say, let's just quit now. Anybody wants to stay and listen to this, I'll do it. You want me? You know, what I was going to do is I was going to do this. I'll, let me just show you. I mean, it's not quite 20 after, but it's almost 20 after, so I could say we're done. But, and we are done, but let me just show you this. Whoa, this thing. Here, you remember this slide? You ever see this slide? Did you ever see this slide somewhere or other? I showed it to you in about one second, one microsecond, and then in the last lab, your TAs went over this. Okay? Now, what's on this slide? This, relates, this actually relates to the midterm. What's on this slide? This is a logistic model, and there's only two variables in the model, and you've already, you either started off with only E's, or you got rid of all the V's and the product terms in the model, and you only have two E's left. And now you're down to the last stage of the modeling strategy. You want to decide what's the best model. Okay? So what do you do? And what I've done over here is a given a list of maybe five different things you could do. That's what I've done. Was that discussed in the lab? Hmm? How many, were you there? You might not have been. I don't know. So what are the, some of the things? So should I talk about it or not talk about it? Uh, talk about who cares, what is, blah, blah. Right. Talk about it. Okay, so it's 20 after. So I'm keeping you, okay? But I'm not going to keep you for until 7. I'm just keeping you for a couple of minutes. Okay, so what do, what do you do? Okay, one thing you do is you say, well, look, I'm done. This is my model. I'm going to be, I'm just going to keep those two variables in the model. And what I'm going to do is, number one is, I'm just going to get a confidence, I'm going to, this is a logistic model, so I'm going to get e to the beta 1, I'm going to get e to the beta 2, and, I, and assuming e1 and e2 are dummy variables for two different variables, and I'm going to get these two odds ratios and their confidence intervals, and I'm going to be able to make some conclusions about whether e1 or e2 on their own are significant given the other variable in the model. So that's one way to do it, and it's not wrong. But there are different ways to do it. Okay, and this is another one. You remember we did this when, we, when I talked about how you might evaluate this situation. You might say, rather than treat E1 and E2 as separate variables, let's treat them as a, as a combined exposure category, a combined exposure. So let's compare somebody who is E1 and E2 with certain values of E1 and E2 with somebody else with two different values of E1 and E2. So that's what I've done here. I've compared E1 star, E2 star with somebody E1 and E2. This might be high, high, and this might be low, low. Sounds like uh, something we talked about, but it might have also been on one of the practice exams. Not sure. Okay. And so you do that, and that's your odds ratio that you're talking about. It's a different thing. You've changed the problem from getting two odds ratios to getting a single odds ratio that combines what the two exposures are. So that's the second one you can do. Now, a third one you could do is BWE, stands for backward elimination, okay? That's a third one. And a fourth one you can do is forward selection, okay? You learned that when you did, uh, when you did Bob Lyle's course last um, spring, okay? Forward selection, you start with nothing and you add variables. Now, typically, you want to start with a model that has them all in there and try to drop them, but... You might get the same answer, or even a different answer if you do forward. So it's not wrong. You could do that and see what you get and compare the results and make some decisions. And then there's this thing called BWCE. What's that? Backward, that's what BW stands for. And what's the CE stand for? Change in estimate. Now, why do I have a question mark here? Why do I have these three question marks? And then there's another question mark. Okay. Why did I have that there? Well, because we're now dealing with E's, right? We're dealing with E's. We're not dealing with C's or functions of the C's that are V's. And we had V's or C's, 
That was when we did change in it, when we talked about the change in estimate approach, we talked about that when we were talking about covariance. We didn't talk about that with regard to E's, we talked about that for C's, or functions of the C's. So you could argue that once you get down to just E's, you shouldn't do anything about change in estimate because you're not dealing with confounding anymore. You're dealing with two variables. You don't know whether either one or both should be in the model. So you're not talking about controlling for them. So that's a reason to say that shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. But we have colleagues, I have colleagues, and some people say, well, maybe you can still talk about this problem because remember we, there's this thing you hated or you loved, DAGs, right? And you could say, well, what about DAGs? What about, can you talk about the DAG that involves the two E's? The DAG, okay? And if you got a DAG something like, um, wherever it is, wherever it is, you've got a DAG something like this, okay? What does this DAG suggest? That E2 is a confounder of the relationship of E1 to D, right? It suggests that, but it's still tenuous because E2 is an exposure variable. It's not a variable you've already put on the list of variables you want to control for. So should you consider this DAG? And it's arguable. So that's what they're going to talk about tomorrow in the lab. So I'm going to skip that for now. But they're going to talk about how you might deal with the DAG problem, and it is something you might want to consider. However, the one thing that they could probably say in the lab also is, whatever you do with this, if you do the change in estimate rule, but you don't do a statistical test to see if whatever, whatever one of these two or both are significant, you're not ask, answering the question whether that variable is important or not. You're just asking whether it's a confounder, given, the, given this DAG. So you still have to do a statistical test there, okay? Now, I'm just saying that. Now, um, uh, now the other thing I said, this is, the la this is sort of the last thing, okay? I'm saying, suppose we, th there was this other thing. I said, whoa, wait a second. Whoa, whoa, hey. Carry out the BWE approach to obtain a reduced model. This, pro this third step has a problem, has a problem. And I'm going to explain the problem, but not go through all the way through it. Again, you could do this in the lab tomorrow. Okay, suppose this is your model. That was the model we talked about. Okay, now suppose it turns out you do backwards elimination. And what does that mean? You eliminate what? What variable? The least significant of these two. And suppose it turns out the least significant of these two is E2. Okay. That would mean after backward elimination, you'd have this model, right? Started with this, you get rid of E2 because it wasn't significant given them both in the model, and then you're left with this, okay? Now my question is, can you conclude that E1 is the only important variable involving these two variables? Can you conclude that? Well, I've got some things to say, okay? And the answer is not necessarily it depends, which is the answer just about everything in this course. Okay. Now, so I say, suppose, and this is where I'm going to sort of stop a little after I explain this. Suppose that in addition to the above results where we dropped E2, suppose that E2 is significant, uh, suppose that E1, not only is E2 not significant in this model, but E1 is not significant in this model. But E1 is, E2 is less significant than E1. So if you're going to do backward elimination, you drop E2 before you drop E1, right? Because E2 is less significant <coughs> than E1 is. But suppose if you kept them both in the model, you'd find that E1 isn't significant either. And then you dropped E1, and you, left, you were left with a model which only has E2 in there, and E2 turned out to be significant. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that E1 is the only important variable? What, where, where does E2 come in? Does that mean E2 is out because it wasn't, as, it, it wasn't as significant as E1? It was less significant? But if we drop E1, which isn't important given E2 in the model, we still get something that's significant. So what do you should include? Well, what I say down at the bottom, what I say here is both E1, if you had this situation, both E1 and E2 are important predictors on their own. 
But once you control for one of them, the other's not important. But on their own, they're important. So to do backwards elimination, if you have this model, there's a problem with that. If you do that by itself and just go with backward elimination, you might miss something. You might drop a variable that's also important. That's what I'm trying to say. And that's what you should think about. That's what could be discussed in the lab tomorrow. And I'm going to stay around if you want to discuss it some more. And I've taken an extra 10 minutes, so time to go, right? Good luck on the exam on Thursday, okay?